The, the challenge that we're going to talk about today is what historical moment are we in? What opportunities do we have to shape the future and how might we actually do it? And it is a very, very exciting time. Yes, I'm a techno-optimist on um, to be living. So I'm going to ask you a set of four questions that I've been asking for the last 15 or 20 years. And what you'll see when you see them is how they've shifted and how they're going to shift. So how many of you read text every day? I think most of you do. Okay. And how many of you write text every day? So you can be very honest. How many of you look at photographs, listen to audio recordings, or watch video on a daily basis? TV means right, everyone. And how many of you take photographs, record original audio, or record original video every day? Okay, look around. So 15 years ago, how many hands would be up? Maybe one, the person whose job was to do it. All right. So daily, a daily media, and what I'd say a daily art practice of encountering the world, documenting it, and sharing it. We've been in the midst of a massive transformation of people's ability to participate in the creation of visual culture. And that's really what Cohen and I started working on many, many years ago. Okay, so how do you do this? And why do you do this? So I actually come out of the humanities. Um, I studied with Wolfgang Eiser, who wrote The Act of Reading, which you kind of read. It's a fantastic book about basically the, the aesthetics of response, what's called reception aesthetics, how viewers and readers create meaning. And um, in my studies in humanities, of course, encountered this great quote from Karl Marx. Um, so the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And in many ways, what you're seeing today, both through art practice, through technical practice, is the practice of transforming ideas into artifacts that actually change the world. So the problem, though, and if any of you have been uh, faculty or students in any university in departments like computer science or information science, or in humanities or in social studies, you'll see that in our universities today we face this problem. Most humanists and social scientists see computation, this massive transformative technology, as mere instrumentality. What I mean by that is that their notion of what it means to learn to be a computer artist is to learn Photoshop, or to learn the tools and techniques of using computers to move bits around, but at a very different level than the level that this conference is about. Because to engage with computa comp uh, computation, not just instrumentality, is to know how to actually write. It's a form of writing technology. The thing to think about code is code is the next evolution in forms of language and writing over the last 10,000 years. Right? It's a new way that people create texts, and in many ways texts that talk back to you. Now, most computer scientists, though, see the humanities and qualitative social sciences as word games which are not actionable. Right, so it's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's all that theory stuff, or you know, I have no idea what that person's saying. Why would I read uh, deconstruction or read a response or structuralism? How would that affect me? And have a largely a disdain for these disciplines. So over the course of the last 20 years, a number of folks around the world have been trying to solve this problem. How do you create interdisciplinary contexts in which these disciplines can learn how to talk to each other? Because each of these attitudes are incorrect. They're both wrong and they don't actually help us solve the most important problems that we have to solve. So what we've been talking about today really is how you ask and investigate fundamental questions and assumptions as a key to intellectual and technological and say artistic innovation. So one of the most important questions that we're going to talk about today, and I hope by the end of our hour together that when you walk away you will answer this question in a different way, is the nature of what is that information? And by and large, our culture, both technical and humanistic, lives with a very unreflected notion of what data and bits and metadata and information actually are, and how they work and how they might be different. What's a document? What's a person? What's context? What is a computational system? And how do we understand what we see? So it's through the investigation of these very basic fundamental questions and assumptions through the design process and, and really the art practice process that people are asking and answering these questions in new ways. And by and large, computer science as a discipline and even information science from the most point has answered this question in a way that ignores the rea real human experience, that ignores what phenomenologists and literary theorists and social scientists know about how language and meaning actually work. So the challenge and the opportunity is to bring these insights together. And what you do by asking and answering fundamental questions, you have to learn each other's languages, practices, and together critically reimagine them. 
And the best ways to do this are these sort of boundary and hybrid people, objects, and spaces to facilitate this process. So at MIT Media Lab, we have the Narrative Intelligence Reading Group, which brought together students, faculty, innovators from around the world, and at MIT in literary theory, media theory, artificial intelligence, and interface design back in the early 90s. And we literally had to read each other's texts and learn how to speak each other's languages. But crucial to that process was really a techno-centered methodology. To use the practice of design to both connect humanistic, social scientific, technological disciplines in an iterative process of constructing and deconstructing theories and artifacts, bringing them together. And that's basically what we've been up to for the last 20 years in the groups that I've been running, and um, you'll see what we've been up to. So, history matters. Um, thank you so much, Eric Pavos, for reminding people that a lot of what's happening now was actually done 30 years ago. Um, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. Um, as a professor at UC Berkeley, and it's really amazing how many, not just students, but even you know advanced students, don't really look past five years ago. Right, sort of they'll cite, because the way that this works, the literature will go back about five years. Um, it's actually useful to go back 5,000 years and work your way forward, if you're working on, on, on any sort of media technology, and understanding the nature of what we're doing, how does it relate to the printing press, and thank you, Fraka, for the telegraph example and, and the music examples as well. So let me, let me give you one from the early 20th century. So when people were starting to think about computation before there were really practical computers to do it with, um, we had really a systems theory in cybernetics. And they began to think of the models of how not hydrogen and carbon would interact, but how humans and computers would form networks, interactive networks with feedback. And the design of a system would be this holistic design of the interactions among these functional components. The discipline of HCI, human-computer interaction, comes out of what was called human factors. The human factor in this network, and how do you affect its performance. Now, when we got to practical computers, there was sort of a lot of forgetting. And basically, it's what I call the PC interlude. And that's when you thought of a single human, a single computer, and interface, and that's all that you designed was that. That's the system that you would build. And so in disciplines like computer science and even interface design, very much the design process largely just took place here. It was a technical design process for the most part. But things have changed massively. And what's actually now the design space that I think we're all operating in, and why I actually left Berkeley to go to Yahoo, is that I wanted to operate in a design space that was the scale of hundreds of millions of people, right? And that's where we're all living now, especially with the opening up of APIs and data for many of the companies that are creating these artifacts, the ability to do design at that scale. So how do you design large-scale socio-technical systems, systems that connect humans and computers and the world together to compute? Luis Van Aan, who's actually from CMU, his work on human computation is very much in the spirit of this type of insight. So when you design large-scale socio-technical systems, the challenges are not just computational, but how do you incent human beings to enter into certain types of relationships with technology and each other and the world, connecting people, the web, and the world? That's what you're designing. You're designing the networks of interactions and connections amongst those components, not just the system. And if you don't think of it at this scale, you miss certain opportunities. So if you think, well, the, one of the crucial things that's occurred, of course, is that there's a lot of understanding over the last five years or so, even 10 years, about how human beings have entered into computation. Really, so how many of you uh, use Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, MySpace? <laughs> Five years ago, of course, other people would have been using MySpace and using Facebook. Actually, I want to ask one other question. How many of you consider yourselves artists? Okay, technologists? And you can raise your hand multiple times. Um, humanists? Social scientists? Inventors? Okay, cool. All right, so this is a hybrid community, which is great. So, what happened? Technologies uh, developed, especially in communications and social technologies, what um, folks have called Web 2.0, Tim O'Reilly and the rest. But five years ago or so, in a massive way, and a little bit more, about 10 years ago, um, something really happened to the internet. And basically, you know, people spend a lot of time, obviously, on the internet, but there's another place people spend a lot of time. It's called the world. And uh, it's a nice place you should visit there sometime. 
And the mediating technology that really affected the connection of the web and the web and the world is why we're here, is the mobile phone. And it's a watershed moment in the ability of computational systems and socio-technical systems to engage not just people and devices, not just people and computers, but people, computers, and the physical environment. So if we think about what is a phone, and that's I enjoyed Fraka's thoughts about that as well. This is a bit reminiscent of what you were doing in your presentation. But to think, what is a phone? Well, of course, it's a personal device carried on the body. And this is really revolutionary to think of the 24-7 ubiquitous pervasive device that is pretty much with the person wherever they are. That was not the case five, 10 years ago. Right? Computers were things you went to go use. They weren't with you all the time. Of course, a two-way voice communication device, a two-way text communication device, Increasingly, obviously, a media consumption device. A little funny story there. So my son is nine. Um, he doesn't have an iPhone yet, but I have one. And um, he said, Dad, can you download Star Wars onto your iPhone? I said, we have a LCD 1080p 42-inch set. <laughs> he said, I want it um, with me. I want it to be mine. So this notion of having media be your own is really fracturing and dividing media consumption in radical ways. Kids growing up now do not think of the TV as the place they go to consume media. They think of their phones. And this was a big surprise for me, because I'm a TV generation person, right? That the phone is becoming really the central media consumption device for a whole generation of people. TV still is important, but the ability to do things in a personal way in media consumption. Now, what's interested me and fascinated me since, really, we talked about data cameras and Gloriana Davenport's work in the early 90s at the Media Lab, was how does the phone become a media production device? How does it enable us to change our answer to that fourth question? And that's really what the phone has done. It's transformed our ability to participate in the creation of visual culture. And importantly, and this is absolutely fundamental in all the work that's been talked about today, is its sensing capability. Right, so back in 1990, when I first met Golan, we were working on a system called Media Streams, which was an iconic visual language to try to enable people to annotate video content so we could add metadata to video to be able to make it manipulable and use it. But what we knew even then was, well, if you just had the camera know where it was and what time it was and who was shooting the video and who was around it and sensing the objects nearby, half the annotations of what was in the content would be automatically generated. These sort of what is actually being recorded could be instrumented and sensed in the camera. And so that was you know, the thinking in 1990, and then in 2002, which I'll show you, basically the Nokia 3650 came to the United States, and this capability happened. Sensing and media capture came together. And so bringing the phone forward, it really becomes the social and cognitive prosthetic device that enables our collective embodied intelligence. A prosthetic, right? This is Haraway's work, which if you don't know, I recommend. Donna Haraway's work on the cyborg, manifesto for cyborgs. How to think about technology as a prosthetic. So I didn't wear glasses when I first met Golan, I do now. Um, other prosthetics we all use as extensions of our capabilities, our cognitive capabilities, our social capabilities, into the environment and connected to our bodies. So the mobile phone is really becoming a ton of type of prosthetic device, always with you, pervasive, extending your sensorium, enabling you to sense and understand and connect beyond your physical body. And what I'll show you later in this talk is to do it at scales that were not even imaginable five or 10 years ago. What does it mean to connect into the activity of 100 million people in real time, right? What does it mean to do that based on where you are in an environment? How do you leave traces in an environment that millions of people can leave and read, right? So the nature of writing and embodiment is being transformed by this prosthetic. 2002, I'm sitting in my Berkeley office looking out at, this is called the Company Light Tower, and in 2002, people were taking photos with their digital cameras or their analog cameras, and I realized, you know, hundreds of people would take basically this same picture every day, thousands of people a year. We've been working on photo and video management technology since the early 90s, and thought, well, they go home, they plug in their camera, and it's pic47.jpg. And that's the metadata. And not even the temporal metadata would be correct, because often the cameras weren't set properly. But the fact is, in this site, in this location, if you are from out of town and you have an imaging device and you're near it, the probability that your vector of attention is going to point there versus the ground or a dog is very, very high. Right? So the physical environment and our experience of it place conditions and helps structure our attention. 
So if we can understand how to model that attention, the photo is simply the record of human attention in the environment. Right? We normally think of a photograph as a bunch of bits or a bitmap, pixels. It's the record of a human vector of attention in the environment existing in a kind of probability space of where I might attend. One way to think about this too is what's the probability that I'm going to photograph my daughter right now? Well, zero. Right? She's, not, she's not here. She's, that's what, it's the weekend. She's not in school. I remember she's in school. The probability that I photograph Golan after having not seen him for a while and I'd like to take his picture, incredibly high. So thinking of media and data as the record of human attention embodied in the physical world. So we were looking at the company and I thought, well, can we capture that information that allows us to predict what people might attend to? And this would solve what we realized is a fundamental problem in, in computer vision. And it's called, there are two. One is called the semantic gap which is the gap between low-level signal analysis and high-level semantic descriptions. Basically, for most computers, that's a vertical off-white rectangular blob on a blue background. That's what they can see. <coughs> what people see is that they know it is the company they tower UC Berkeley. And the reason computers have so much trouble in traditional com computational systems, systems that assume that bits live in databases, that pixels don't connect to the physical world, and that the algorithms and systems that we write analyze that data in a disembodied way, don't um, face what's called the sensory gap. And this is the gap between how an object appears and what it is. So here's the company LA Tower, and different images of the same object can appear dissimilar, and this isn't even under radically different lighting or, or, or point of view conditions, but these photos actually from a kind of pixel-wise level, and even structurally, look different. And it's difficult to solve that these are the same. But there's also the problem that images of different objects can appear similar. So the company LA Tower UC Berkeley, Washington Monument, the company LA Tower UC Berkeley, and the company LA in Venice, which is actually modeled after. So you have to think, how is it that we understand what we see? How do I know that this rug is, you know, that I'm looking at is here at CMU and not the, the bizarre rug that would be in some uh, friend's house I grew up with in the 70s in the valley in LA? <laughs> right. It would have been shag, but that's a different detail. So how do we understand what we see? How do we actually do it? So I'll tell you a little story to help you illustrate this about computer vision and context. So this is sort of what it's like to be a computer doing computer vision before you have this understanding of the real nature of how people see and what information is. So uh, imagine you go out drinking with your friends. And you get drunk. Really drunk. And you get hit over the head and pass out. And you're flown to a city in a country you've never been to with a language you don't understand and an alphabet you can't read. And you wake up face down in a gutter with a terrible hangover. You have no idea where you are or how you got there. Well, that's what it's like to be most computer vision systems, and in fact, most computers. They have no context, they have no memory. They don't know where they are or how they got there. But because of the invention of the mobile phone, and especially the camera phone, with imaging and sensing and communication and processing and programmability and all the things we've talked about together, we have a way to transform the nature of visual culture because now we can start to understand what we see, not just ourselves, but the prosthetic devices that we have. What we see, what we hear, what we experience. So context is really what enables us to understand what we see. So the basic idea we had back in 2002 was could we leverage the spatiotemporal context and the social community of media capture and mobile devices? Gather all the automatically available information at the point of capture, accurate time, spatial location, and who was using it, etc. Analyze this metadata and the media and find similar things that have been captured before, and use these patterns to suggest, oh, well, if you're here at this place at this time and you're this person, you're probably taking a picture of this person or this thing or this place. And other people who are like you have taken similar types of images. See, we really love to believe, especially in the art crowd, that all human beings are unique. And of course, we are all unique genetically, except for identical twins, but unique in our backgrounds. But the reason that sociology actually is somewhat of a discipline is that people have actually predictable behavior patterns and interests and affections and desires. And the ability to do computational social science and start to understand, and also behavioral economics, is another discipline wrestling with these questions to model human behavior in ways that we can make predictions. And also then to interact with people to make the system smarter about what people might actually attend to. So in 2002, 
Uh, this was the Sidepick Stylecam Blink, which was a $40 uh, little VGA imager that used USB. And, you know, Moore's Law is a great thing, and also having sponsors that give you stuff. So these we had to buy. But in 2002, uh, Nokia also released the 3650, which was the first uh, programmable Series 60 camera phone to come to the U.S. shores, and also the first Nokia phone with an integrated imager. So we were fortunate enough in, in late 2002 to start to get about 70 of these. And then taught a class where we had basically 70 people over 10 months use software to do this. And then the next year we were able to use the 7610. And to go to, to speak to Julian's talk, um, yes, we were the academics who had the privilege to actually simulate a piece of the future. Right, so we were intentionally realizing that we had an opportunity because we had people that interacted with each other in the same place, in the same time, being able to write software that we knew would be five years, six years down the road, available on all the, the phones that you guys are using, but not quite yet, as you see. And simulate what it would be like to have a daily practice of image uh, capture, annotation, and sharing. And that's what we did at UC Berkeley back in 2003 4. At the time, our mobile media uh, metadata project, MMM and MMM2, I was about 30 folks working on it, 10 industrial sponsors. And then Moore Naman, whose work I highly recommend you guys look at, was doing his PhD on locale. The same question of how attitude and position and intention and attention in physical space could be aggregated over enough people to predict what is salient and what people would tend to. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get Moore to come join us when we founded Yahoo Research Berkeley, and then we created a version of a, basically this technology and, uh, called ZoneTag, which is still available today for Series 16 Motorola phones which does basically this thing. It knows where you are, it knows what time it is, it knows who you are, it knows who you know, and it predicts what you might actually photograph and suggest tags. So when you take a photograph of zone tag and you say, yes, I'll post it to Flickr, you can just click one more button to upload it and it'll go, which is important, right? People do want the ability to just upload. This was like the first two-click uploader out there to actually connect to the web. And it was, that, what was the feature people loved the most? That they could just go click, click, and upload to the internet. This was back in, you know, mid, about 2005 when we were doing this. But what would also happen is that it would suggest, based on the probability of who you were and what time it was and what location you're in, how you, your patterns were those people, what other tags might be there. Not only in a sort of unstructured list, but also it had a concept of place and event. So, What's fundamental in this is if you think of our experience in the physical world, what we're starting to create are mappings between data that lives on the internet and actual locations in the world. And what I'll talk about in the next few minutes is how that becomes possible through technologies that you may or may not know, to, know about to map everything that's out there, people, places, objects, events, into a representation that would allow you to predict what people, places, objects, and events human beings might actually attend to and find interesting. So in ZoneTag, this would upload to Flickr. You'd be able to add your own tags if you want. It would also do automatic tags, what are called machine tags, where it used both cell tower and GPS and Bluetooth, actually, to do uh, location and co-sensing of people around you, and would automatically geotag your photos, suggest tags for your photos as well. So this is a little close-up of that. So what you're beginning to see is the transition from the space of data that's disembodied to data that connects to a namespace actually connected to the physical world. Sunnyvale, California, 9489, USA. And um, this, this kind of interesting geekoid stuff at the bottom is basically the cell tower structure that you can actually get from sensing the phone. So the reason the iPhone knows your location is it's using three different sensing technologies, right? It's understanding the mapping of the cell tower to its actual location. And with ZenTag, we created one of the first databases that mapped GPS locations to cell tower locations that Eric and others were doing stuff around, around the same time. And also then mapping Wi-Fi beacons and basically then using GPS. So multiple beacon technologies are used in phones to actually understand your location. I'll talk about that in a minute. But here's the thing I really want to explain and why this is philosophically interesting and technically and artistically interesting. So this really hard problem of understanding who you took a picture of. It's a classic computer vision problem. People have worked on it forever. Face recognition. So real photos, not the canned pretty ones that everyone uses in the papers. But we you know, had a database of 35,000 geotagged photos back in you know, 2005. 
rare. And including, you know, knowing who these people are, not when they're looking face on the camera. So how do you do this? Well, and this is documented in, uh, this is the ACM Multimedia and the Society and uh, it's Photonic and Something Engineers. Okay. Yeah. Interesting conference. Um, okay, we looked at the database of photos and said, if we just looked at the pixels, if we just look at the bits, and we applied at the time the best image analysis algorithms in the world, this is time for principal component analysis. How good could we do on real data that real people create? And you could get about 43% accuracy to guess who's in the photograph. Now imagine this. What if you applied, and this was worked on with John Canning and others at Berkeley, if you applied uh, sparse factor analysis on the contextual metadata, if you just looked at when the photo was taken, where it was taken, and who took it, could you convert that contextual metadata around the information object to help you predict the content of the object? What you're resolving is using contextual metadata to predict a vector, a probabilistic vector of attention in the world, and resolving to the objects that that vector would touch. That's a different way of thinking of the nature of what bits are. Standard computer vision basically looks at the pixels, does attempt to, attempt to recreate the world in some cases, but is doing it in a way that human beings find hard to do. Remember, we use context to understand what we see. So here's the cool thing. It was actually more accurate to not look at the image at all. Remember the sensory gap, right? Images of the same thing can look different. Images of different things can look the same. How do humans actually do it? Well, we use context. So blind computer vision context alone outperformed computer vision. And um, adding the two together, because it does help to actually see, um, got us to 60%. Now, if any of you are computer vision researchers, you may not know this stuff because it was done in the multimedia community, but these kinds of differences in performance are really rare, right? If you get like a 5 or 10% increase, you know, they give you an award and everyone's excited. But what this is showing is a fundamental shift in the nature of information and how we model it, right? Thinking about photos, video, audio, bits, not as things that live in databases and are analyzed purely on their own terms, but as the product of human attention and activity in the physical world and modeling that attention and activity with metadata to reconstruct human attention in the wild. And uh, we did the same thing for place recognition and got even more powerful results as well. So this uh, gave us pause because it was, an ex we used design research basically to create the data that would allow us to do experimental research to validate a theory about the nature of information. And by doing that, we then continued doing a lot more design research and a lot more thinking about the nature of information, how it's structured. So here's what's actually occurred over the last number of years that has really fundamentally transformed the nature of the internet. So <clears throat> 10 years ago, the graph of who you are and who you know was barely accessible. Right? There wasn't a computational resource to say, who are the people in this room? Who do they know? Who do they communicate with? But the social graph as a computable structure, as an accessible structure to represent people and their relationships, is now something that you know, is regularly used every day by all of us in this room and available to research and design. But there are other graphs as well. And really, there's the graph of places and spaces. They tend to be trees as well as graphs, that there's some graph structure here. And what I'll talk about in a little bit, too, is how these bits of data are also available. Ways to represent not just people and their relationships, but places and their relationships. The kind of um, sad you know, sister of this is time. And what's really amazing to me, and I'll share a result here, is that you think of time as, oh yeah, OK, sure, just time put everything, we're done. It turns out time is the most important piece of metadata of all. And we found in the predicted, predicting what people would attempt, and you think why, right? Because most sort of technical folks th think, OK, time, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and this happens. I just timestamp. But think of human life, right? You can imagine a spectrum between lunatics and prisoners, OK? So this is the mapping between behavior and attention and time. So a prisoner, 6 o'clock, wake up, 6.30, breakfast, 7 o'clock, work in the prison laundry. So at that theoretical extreme, time absolutely predicts behavior and attention. A lunatic, moment to moment, there's no way to know what the, the, the lunatic's going to do, and neither does the lunatic, right? So you're at that extreme. So where are most human beings in industrialized cultures, in especially urban cultures? 
their patterns and their engagements and their routines exist in a more patterned way here on the prisoner side than on the lunatic side. And so if all of us were lunatics, time would be completely unpredictive of behavior. If we were all prisoners, it would be completely predictive. So you have this spectrum to think about it. And what turns out to be most important is not just absolute time, but to think of the periodic cycles of time, day versus night, weekend versus weekday, seasons of the year, the meaning you have at four o'clock each week, the rituals that you do throughout your day periodically. Because time organizes human behavior and sociality, attention, work, play, and the rest. And it's one of the easiest pieces of metadata to get, and it's one of the least exploited. And finally, what's occurring, and I'm going to talk, not going to talk a lot about this, but because more people did today, is the Internet of Things, the ability to sense objects around you using RFID and the rest, and uh, QR codes and things like that. So what becomes interesting is I think if I have these four different graph structures, if I have the structure of people and their relationships, places and their relationships, time and its periods and the objects around me, I'm, what is happening now, we're at a moment historically where we are making models of human activity in the world inside of computers and connecting those computers to human activity. So you can start to think of the metadata for web four, web to the fourth, basically, just the intersection of where, when, who, and what, as the new type of infrastructure for computing and especially mobile computing. So what's enabling this, a lot of this has been discussed today, are new types of sensors that give us the ability to be embodied. Really what it's doing is giving the internet a body. Right? The phone gives the internet a body, it gives it a memory, it gives it context, and allows embody the lived world of human beings to actually intersect with the web in meaningful ways. So positioning, orientation, heading, Calendar is actually an interesting indicator of location, too, if people care to add the strings for it. The camera, network time, calendar and camera again. Device IDs, user IDs, Bluetooth. The address book, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is an amazing resource for people to keep them. Also, the call logs of communication and email and the rest. There's all sorts of signals about who people are and who they find important and why. And then the objects are noticed as well. So the sensing capability of devices is really connecting the web and the world. So what I'm, this is, in some ways, the most important slide for you guys to get. I want you to think about every bit that lives in the internet as having originated from the physical world. Actually, Julian had a really nice quote yesterday in the workshop. I think you said, every bit on the internet you know, comes from somewhere in the physical world. Is he still here? Yeah, I think you said that in the workshop yesterday, which is great. All right, so think of every bit in the internet is originating from some point in physical space and time and people. What you could think of as web four space. So imagine this is not a strict n dimensional mathematical model. This is a uh, visualization to think with. So imagine the axis of where you are, when it is, who you are and who you know, and what the objects are around you. So imagine you're moving through space and time and people and objects. So you're really creating a path through web four space in your day. So think of this workshop today. Each of you got up, hopefully had a shower, had breakfast. You found your way here. You came together. You were attending all sorts of different things. And here we are right now, at this time, in this place. All of the strands and paths through Web4 space have begun to come together in these manifolds, in these densities, in these knots of human attention. And so the probability that you guys are attending to what I'm saying now hopefully is high. I don't think it is. Many of you are recording what's happening right now. You're taking pictures, you're recording audio. So the probability that the recordings you're making are of me, how high is that probability? Incredibly high, right? I don't have to look at any of the recordings to know that. Because in a way, the architecture and dynamics of human experience bring, the, bring these trails of attention to this moment, to this place, to this time. So how many of you use hashtags on Twitter? Okay. That's a great hack to do what should actually be built into the basic infrastructure of the internet. Meaning, if we know where, when, who, and what for every bit, every piece of data that comes out of this event could be aggregated under these um, art and code hashtag without the hashtag existing. Because what hash art and code is, is a manifold, is an envelope of human attention and activity within one floor space. And what we're missing is the infrastructure to create that kind of metadata for every bit on the web. And that's what we've been working on over the last several years and doing all the patents on. 
Okay, so let me take you a little bit further. So back when we were doing MMM2, we started to explore these manifolds, these densities of attention and activity in web four space. And so when we were doing the face recognition work, we had to build a tool to annotate stuff. And we realized, oh, well, given this propensity of people to have common attention and based on when, where, and who, and what, we were able to look at the photos and sort of grow the set by saying, well, show me photos taken within similar time, similar location. And this was basically a way of clustering them to annotate them. And then Kerry Bergener, um, <laughs> um, Golan as well, and actually I think Golan introduced me to, uh, and Benjamin Hill, one of my students, built what we call the system metadata propagation. This is, hasn't been published. That's part of what I want to show to you all. Uh, the, the student project is still up on the web, I believe. Uh, AMP. And what AMP does, if you look, is you could say, okay, I want to have a slider of similarity based on location, hour of the day, people around me, who the photo was shared with, day of the week, the photographer. And these clusters would dynamically change, becoming manifolds in web 4 space. So the media would be organized around its similarity based on its origination and its patterns of, of movement as well. Because it's not just the origination point of the data that matters. It's also how you share it, what happens, what is the social life of the information. So mobile apps and browsers that can access native functions on the device, and I put browsers there for a very important reason. How many of you know that there are browsers now out that actually have location and APIs built into them for phones? Okay, so realize if you're gonna do a location or app, luckily, there are browsers available on the iPhone and Opera's gonna be doing this and others as well. If you don't have to be able to just to write an app, you can even do things in HTML that start to use sensors. Though coding is important, I don't wanna just that at all. So mobile apps and browsers that can access native functions on the device make the mobile phone a sensor and a sensor network that can add contextual metadata to data. And by having this, we can make sense of this data by connecting it to the real world context in which it's produced, shared, and consumed. So what we're talking about is imagine every piece of data on the web and every person, place, time, object, and event in the world having this web form metadata attached to it from its creation and throughout its life cycle. That's what mobility makes possible to literally connect the bits of the web to the activity in the world through metadata that exists along. We're not there yet, but we've made tremendous strides and we're getting there very quickly. Now, this matters a lot to folks in Silicon Valley. Why? Well, how, how do most internet companies make money? They sell advertising. What's advertising? It's trying to either create attention or meet a predicted attention. Oh, you're thinking of buying a car, why not look at this one? You're hungry, get this pizza. And so if you're an advertising-based web company, you're basically inviting, capturing, connecting, guiding, and monetizing human attention. What people pay attention to, where they do it, and the places they attend to, when they do it, and the events they attend to, and who they are, and the people they attend to. So there's a lot of activity in industry now, and also in research too, about understanding how contextual metadata transforms not only our ability to model information for media and for our practice and for sociality, but to change the nature of how marketing and advertising work. We'll do another talk some other time about how word of mouth becomes much more important in this. So don't fear, it's not just gonna be getting dancing bad mortgage ads at you. But the example I would use is this. Advertising that is a message from someone I don't care about, about something I don't care about, that's annoyance. If it's about something I care about, but not from someone I care about, it's information. But you know, if I'm in Pittsburgh and I'm not with all of you and I don't know where to go eat, and someone I trust is actually eating at a really good vegetarian restaurant, and they can tell me that, and I can get a coupon from that restaurant to go there when I'm hungry, well, that's a gift. Given to me by someone I trust for something I actually care about. And so the ability to understand human attention allows the transformation of the nature of marketing and advertising in fundamental ways to capture the types of processes of word of mouth recommendation, either in real time or aggregatively in non-real time. And that's part of what we're seeing mobile headed from a monetization point of view. All right, so I want to go in a little bit more detail on social and who to help you grok that. So what's been happening in the social graph is there's these basic atoms of structure that people use to create social networks. A follows B, A is followed by B, A and B follow each other, A and B create a mutually reciprocated relationship. So quick quiz. Which systems work like this? that are popular. Or let me say this, which is Twitter? That one, which is Facebook? Right, okay. Now, 
it's very interesting to think about the di different dynamics in these relationships. These are really important for when you're creating a social network. Because you're saying, I know this person, you know me, yes, we're really each other, I want to attend to you. This is really important if you're creating an attention network. Because you also want the structures above. In other words, people that are broadcasting out lots of stuff may not want to receive information from everyone else. So these basic architectures of attention and connection form all the different social systems you're seeing out there. These atoms then form molecules. And these molecules also have interesting structures, and they're folks you know, that spend their lives analyzing these graph structures to try to make predictions about human behavior. Hubs, spokes, different sorts of patterns of attention, and how messages diffuse and propagate across these networks. The thing I want you to think about, though, is that these networks, these articulated networks of relationships among human beings, weren't accessible to design in the same way, and computation in the same way, that they are now. That's one of the great resources we have as artists, designers, tinkerers, thinkers, is to be able to design and work with these graph structures. And fundamental to them, and this is one of the biggest differences between MySpace and Facebook and others, is the privacy architecture. Because when you think of A and B related to each other, who can see that relationship? Do you need to be connected A? Does C need to know A to see B? Do, you know, do I make my connections available on LinkedIn to others or not? Is my information public, private, or shared with other folks? So physical architecture really matters to human beings, right? We don't go to the bathroom in public in this culture, though others do, and it's fine. But um, we use architecture, physical architecture, to organize our activities of disclosure and connection. Digital architectures have the same sorts of affordances, and that's why privacy and the structure of social privacy changes the nature of the publics and the interaction spaces that people have with one another. And these subtle distinctions about who can see what can be the difference between massively successful systems and terribly unsuccessful ones. Okay. Another point, this design of the socio-technical system and of the social graph architectures is based on fundamental social psychological insights. Really, the structures all the nature of, of social attention comes from really these two patterns. So, um, shared attention is based first on contact attention. When you're an infant, you learn to trust and look at your mother or your father or your caretaker and establish rapport with them. You develop eye contact, you, learn, you recognize faces when you, when you come out, and you develop a relationship with that person. And so we learn this very, very early in life. Think of Facebook, think of Twitter, think of MySpace. You create a connection with another. But the other way that attention works is joint attention. I notice that Eric is looking over there at this, not at me, which is fun. <laughs> I notice what someone I trust notices, and I shift my attention there. So Twitter, Facebook, all these streams of attention are structured by our built-in learning that we do as infants to look at what others look at and find it worth paying attention to. So all successful social networks and social graph architectures use these two basic forms of human attention and then put privacy architectures around them in different ways to structure different kinds of systems. So when you think of socio-technical design, these basic forms of attention and interaction and connection are really the, the core elements. So um, another thing that we really thought about, too, is how this affects media production and design. And I think this is quite relevant, actually, for this crew here. This was work done with my PhD student, Ryan Shaw. And this is in the book, The Long Tail. Um, they, they describe this as the architecture of participation, which I think was a, a Ryan Gold term. But here's the basic idea. And what I'm showing you, too, along the way, you'll notice I'm showing you lots of sort of graphs for understanding the nature of information and how it flows. And that's the key design tool that we use in this practice. If you can create a design space, a way to understand the core components of the system or problem, and understand them in relationship to each other along certain axes, you can solve for where the missing information is, where the missing solution is, and how these things relate to each other. So if you think of media production and consumption, producers make the media and they often add explicit information, and consumers don't make the information and they usually, they don't add metadata to the data, right? So someone makes a movie, another person watches it, and there's implicit data that flows that way. But as was um, talked about earlier uh, by Julian, the fan writers and the um, fans in Star Trek, enthusiasts add entirely new value to the social media ecosystem, both by adding metadata to media and by creating new productions through re remixing. So what we're looking at is a media ecology that's evolved now over the last 
10 or 15 years that includes not only production and consumption, but enthusiasts and remixers, and importantly, different types of metadata around information objects that help us understand what they are. And consumption metadata is actually incredibly important, not just view counts, but things I'll talk about later that help us understand the nature of the information object. So, if you're gonna design a socio-technical system, you're not just making an application or a user interface. You're designing a network topology. How do users connect to each other? What, what is the data and metadata that flows over this network? Who can see it? What are the permissions and the structure of the architecture? And very importantly, how do you optimize certain activities at the nodes of the system? If we're computing at the scale of millions of people and millions of devices interacting with each other, very subtle contributions, minor contributions, or byproducts of activity can be massively important. One thing I'll show you in a few minutes is a system where we analyzed 30 million geocoded photos on Flickr. Now people were taking their photos and uploading them, tagging them, largely for their own use, not for the system, but as a byproduct of their activity in aggregate, there's enough signal there to create really tremendous value. And so how do you incentivize and support particular individual and social activities? How do you design metrics for monitoring and analytic mechanisms to understand these systems and to do this rapidly and iteratively? So the real challenges of design exist now at very different scales of architecture and construction. What's happening today and over the last five years is we can begin to think of systems not just that the artist and an audience interact, but that all of us in real time with each other connecting are constructing and recording and annotating and shaping our understanding of the world and one another. And so that's the most exciting zone in my view for aesthetic and artistic activity is the shaping of the human recording and description and sharing of our experience at this very, very large scales. That's what these technologies are making possible. And all this, of course, requires radically interdisciplinary teams of people, which I've talked about before. Okay, I'm going to um, jump through a little bit. Key thing is that social media is not just fun photos that people share or tweets that they do, but it's really the platform systems and applications that connect media, technology, and people into a value creation and processing network. Right? We're designing systems that compute and that affect both computational and human behavior by the nature of their structure, their engagement, and the function of the nodes. So going back to sharing, I had mentioned earlier why does sharing seem to matter? Why is the human practice of exchanging information <coughs> objects interesting other than its intrinsic value? Well, think of this from a kind of photo and video management point of view. If a parent takes a photo of his child on the child's birthday, who does the person want to share it with? Who should see that object? If you know that it's a birthday photo taken at that place at that time of those people, rather than the very difficult decision parents face, should this be public, should this be private, how do I do it? The manifold and web force space says, oh, well, the grandparents definitely need to see it and probably need to be alerted that the photo exists. It needs to be a push object, whereas the public, you know, in this case, may not want to actually be allowed to see it. So this ability to manage our disclosure and engagement with one another, a lot of that information exists in the context in which we do things. And similarly, how do you go from sharing to content metadata? So if a bird watcher takes a photo in a bird sanctuary and sends it to their bird watching group, what do you think it's a photo of? Probably a bird. Right, so this is a way of thinking about the nature of information that human activity in the world and with each other shapes our ability to compute and understand what that media is and how it should be shared. So the next system we built was MMM2, where we were lucky to get the 7610s, a little bit easier to program. We actually worked with the Helsinki Institute for Information Technology, both on this and prior project, with uh, Mika Rainto, who went on to do Jaiku and, and others and had a com very funky combination of a native application running in the background that would be able to log context and use the sensors and then launch um, the Opera web browser to basically uh, give a user interaction. So you take a photo, you could add metadata if you want. We had built the tagging system before, here we were working on sharing, and it would automatically suggest the likely recipients for the photo based on context. Right? So that list would change depending on where you were and when it was and who you were and who you tended to share with so that you could articulate the sharing pattern based on context. The other thing I want to explain too about how sharing and human attention to media affects our ability to operate with it is what Flickr does in interestingness. How many of you know Flickr? Is that fairly well known? How many of you know what interestingness is on Flickr? In case a fewer number, okay. 
Are these photos interesting, beautiful, unique, worth looking at? I think they're pretty cool, right? So what human curated this collection of media objects? What editor did Flickr pay to select these photos? The answer is the entire community for free, right? So if you think of the nature of work and processing, why? Because depending on how this information lives in the social graph, lets us know whether a photo is interesting or not. So what this is from the Flickr website, there are lots of elements that make something interesting or not. What the click-throughs are coming, where the click-throughs are coming from, who comments on it and when, who marks it as a favorite, its tags, and many more things which are constantly changing. So the ability to take a billion photographs and surface the you know, 0.0001% of them that are visually interesting is not because computers are analyzing the content of the images because they're analyzing the transactions of human attention and patterns of engagement through the social graph. That's a fundamental shift in the nature of how we deal with media that Flickr helped pioneer, and it's one of my favorite examples of why this stuff actually matters to understand social context. The other thing to think about in the social design of information systems is what we do with Yahoo Answers. Um, my team was involved early on, and we were asked the question, uh, we want to get you know, 100 million people that answer questions for each other, should we use money? What's the right answer? And why? Why is, it, why is it the right answer not to use money? Because people don't like to pay. Right, because you don't want to be paid to do what you love in that case. You won't get, right. What? You won't get real answers. Well, you do. So Google at the same time, strangely enough, built a thing called Google Answers. Have you ever used Google Answers? Right, that was paid experts. It actually stopped working, they shut it down, and they opened up something similar. Basically, everyone is a nerd about something. Right? Everyone is a nerd about something. Each of you has a passion, a desire, perhaps a fetish, or an interest that engages you where in your precious free time, you will let other people know about something there. Um, Aardvark, Vark is sort of in this space as well. Actually, Wilton Davies, who's their chief scientist, came out of Yahoo, so the, the good ideas spread around all over. Um, but what we did is we designed game dynamics to incent human behavior for people to contribute their free time to answer each other's questions. So what Yahoo Answers is, it's a hundred million node socio-technical system that answers questions. I come from AI originally. Well, actually, humanity's an AI. The problem of can we build a question answering machine? Right? That's been a 40-year goal for artificial intelligence. Yes, we built the question answering machine. It's 100 million people with computation connecting them with the right incentive systems. Right? So this is what socio-technical system design means. Creating interactions among people that can actually solve hard problems. Okay. The next thing we actually looked at was the nature of mobile communications and how it actually worked. And this was uh, several years ago, uh, Joe Hayashi, myself, and others, we were looking at can we use the ambient awareness of presence and activity to lead to communication and social connection? And can we re-architect mobile communications in a way that's people-centric and not channel-centric? In other words, today still in most systems you think of communicating through Facebook, Flickr, or MySpace, Twitter. You don't think of, I want to know everything Golan's doing, which I do. Every tweet he's putting out, every photo he's creating on Flickr, or whatever the information comes, we're modeling it not as destination sites or even feeds, but as people in the real world that we're connected to who create and spout data, data streams. And how can we ground those and connect them to the real people? And how can we do this in a way that can, I can produce easily once and publish anywhere, publish anywhere and consume in one place, and do it in a way that is location aware and socially connected? So we built this um, iPhone app called OneConnect, which then became the Yahoo um, mobile app. And then the part I like the best is this works in the browser on hundreds of phones. You go in, you say what social networks you're on. And it builds a model saying, this unique idea of this human maps to these ideas on all these other networks. But it also does the inverse. So that if I'm connected to Golan or Eric on Twitter and Facebook and Flickr, those ideas become one. So you build a different type of architecture that allows me to send my information out to multiple sites. So I can say I'm enjoying doing my keynote at Arkham Code and post it on multiple sites at once. And also for the same person who's creating things all over the internet to come to me really in one integrated one on my phone. So that's what actually open aggregation does. And 
Oops. So this is um, a mobile website that looks at all the different people in my life and the different things they're doing. Um, a lot of them are doing stuff on Facebook. A lot of them are doing it on Twitter. Some of them are doing it on both. And it's able to understand really what I'm getting from people as opposed to what I'm getting from channels. Um, what you'll see coming up later is um, when this refreshes is that you can see the same message from Twitter and Facebook once, not multiple times, because you're getting it from the same person. So this is the idea of being able to stay connected to the people I care about in my life wherever they are on the internet by modeling the graph of human beings in the relationships. Now this is an enticing view that's coming up here we'll get to in one moment. Oh wow, and I'm almost out of time. Okay. All right, time. We talked about cycles. This is a project we did called Photo LOI, Photo Level of Interest. So if we think of interestingness, remember Flickr said they look at time? Well, if you have accurate time code, and you look at when people are photographing or capturing or tweeting or creating any sort of information with a certain amount of phasing, you can actually say that's probably the interesting part of what happened out of that. Why? Because human beings started expressing interest in it through their actions and their sharing actions. So we analyze photographs over time. You can even do it with different communities to say, what are the hackers photographing and writing about versus what are um, non-hackers doing to experiments like that. And you build a histogram of human attention over time based on media production. You can do this on consumption, too. So if you think of a media player that's instrumented by when do people watch and when do they stop, and you build a histogram of attention, you can just draw a threshold and get the highlights. When, what parts of the media do people find interesting? What parts of the event do people find interesting? So the instrumentation of human um, attention, both in production and consumption, allows us to create this information around the artifact, the contextual metadata, to understand both in the event and its recordings what people find interesting. Okay. I'm going to 10 more minutes? Good, okay. So we talked about the different, we're going to talk about where. We've talked a lot about who, I want to get that back to where. Cell towers give us resolution from about 1,000 to 10,000, Wi-Fi 100, Bluetooth 10. Hybrid sensing systems, and adding GPS or around Bluetooth to Wi-Fi accuracy, give us the ability to know where people are. But knowing where you are isn't enough, because there's a difference between space and place. There's just me knowing that I'm at this GPS coordinate versus knowing where I am actually in the world. So one of the things I actually did at Yahoo is a thing called GeoPlanet. It's based on where on Earth's technology, where you could geotag by a centroid, which is sort of tell you you're at that point of the map. And this is uh, Tyler Bell. Uh, thank you for this slide. Uh, you could geotag by wall ID. Associates the content with the entire place, in this case, the idea of San Gabriel, right? Region hierarchies of regions in physical space, right? So we are in this building, or in this room, in this building, in this part of campus, in this neighborhood in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, in this county, in this state, in this part of the United States, in this hemisphere, on this planet, and going out. Right, so creating a namespace that maps just unique identifiers for all the places and regions in the world gives you the ability to start to talk about place. Unique ideas that are permanent, global, language neutral, semantically structured, gives you an ability to start to articulate and work with regions of space that are meaningful to human beings. We also, uh, how many of you have Fire Eagle? Is that well known here or not? Actually, very few. Okay. Um, so, Fire Eagle, Tom Coates, and Moore Naman, and others, uh, Simon King, worked on technologies to make it very easy for people to have any sensor update your location. Any application consume user location and have the privacy management handled in the cloud. And the API, this is a working system, really interesting, excellent system, because it uses the same low ID hierarchy of region declaration. So I can say, let people know where I am at the city level. Let people know where I am at the county level, or let them know where I am at the neighborhood level. So this is part of this notion of the architecture of privacy, in this case around location, so that there are location producers. Any app can be a producer. Any app can be a consumer or a website. And this is the architecture that mediates the production and consumption of user location across the ecosystem. Now, when we think of what is location, so if I say, um, my phone says I'm at the Golden Gate Bridge, and I'm going to take a photo. OK, if I'm at the Golden Gate Bridge, and I'm taking a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge, that's, you know, that makes sense. That's the one on the left. But if I'm at the Albany Marina, that's also a place I would take a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. Why? 
Because a point on the map isn't a body in space looking at things. Right? Location isn't enough. Orientation, heading, attention. Remember, vectors of attention in physical space. So you have the difference between the viewer location and the viewed location in these two photographs. It's the same in one, and it's basically different in the other. Kodak understood this like four years ago. So have any of you ever seen a Kodak picture spot? OK, this is all the old people in the room. Um, this location recommended by top photographers to help you tell the story of your visit in pictures. <laughs> So you'd be on the physical world, and there'd be a picture spot, and would say, take a photo from here of that. <laughs> and it would be helpful, right? So this is a good place to photograph the waterfall, or you know, the gorge, or the canyon, or the mountain, or the landmark. Well, you can see where I'm headed, right? We, now we're creating a world of virtual Kodak picture spots. Understanding every place on the planet, where is an interesting place to take a picture? Where is an interesting place to look, to attend? And so landmarks tend to have this topology, where you're looking around it, the Eiffel Tower in the center, everyone looking around it, the Campanile Tower, the uh, Cathedral of Learning would be another example. And vista points, when you're up looking out at an expanse, have this kind of topology of attention. So it's not all innocent, though. We're not only looking at the world and each other, but we're being looked at as well. So Tad Hirsch made an amazing system called IC, which is a collective map of surveillance cameras. And I'd like to show a brief video illustrating that. Since 1998, the Institute for Applied Autonomy has developed technologies that enable average citizens, political protesters, and the functionally paranoid to defend their way of life. Closed circuit television, or CCTV surveillance of public space is on the rise, using cameras installed on buildings, ATM machines, and traffic lights, police officers and private security guards monitor our every move. A 1998 survey documented over 2,400 cameras in New York City's public places. Since then, the number has continued to skyrocket, with more cameras on the way. It has become virtually impossible to avoid CCTV's prying eyes. Until now, using advanced artificial intelligence technology, the Institute for Applied Autonomy has developed IC, an inverse surveillance system that helps people track and avoid CCTV cameras. <laughs> Visitors to the IC website are presented with a map of New York City highlighting surveillance camera locations. Predictably enough, the majority are in areas of great financial value, such as Midtown and the Financial District, even though street crime is more prevalent in low-income neighborhoods. Users click the map to indicate a current location and a desired destination, and IC's route planning algorithm provides a path of least surveillance, avoiding as many cameras as possible. This map may be printed out for later use. Since its launching in October of 2001, IC has produced well over one million unique maps and has been extended to Manhattan, Amsterdam, and Ljubljana. In addition, IC has provoked public debate over CCTV use in such publications as Wired Magazine and the London Financial Times, and on websites including Slashdot and Fox News. IC is also featured on Yahoo's Travel and Transportation Guide to New York City. In August of 2002, the IAA released an updated IC client optimized for mobile and wireless devices. This version allows IC to also function as a data collection tool, enabling groups of users to quickly and easily create and share maps of their city's surveillance infrastructure. IC. Now more than ever. I'm really sorry that Tad could not be here and have the flu because this, I think this is absolutely brilliant work and really relevant to what I'm going to show you next. See, because what Tad is looking at is how does the architecture of physical space and surveillance affect human behavior and attention? How do you get, how do you avoid being seen? What we looked at is if we can have records of what people are seeing and find worth paying attention to, can we automatically create a collective map of human attention for the planet? Can we make the invisible visible, the impermanent permanent, record explicit and implicit human attention, look at the patterns, 
do it at multiple scales, and enable new forms of communication and art. So if you think about it abstractly, a person pays attention to something in the world, that's an attention map. If they add any symbol to it, it's a tag map. If they say it's something they're interested in, it's an interest map. And if the thing they're interested in has economic value of some type, it becomes a brand map. So in Flickr, there's millions and millions of geocoded photos. Here's the CMU area that we're in. And uh, actually, the photo I took yesterday in Julian's workshop is located on the map there. Also, interesting was applies uh, spatially as well. So Flickr can tell you what the interesting photos are within space. But this only shows you of the thousands and thousands and thousands of photos there, what are the interesting ones. Um, but doesn't really tell you what those places mean and how people describe it. So here's a tag map of the CMU area. This looks at the photos that have been geotagged, the tags that people have uh, added to them, and does what's called term frequency inverse document frequency. It figures out for this given symbol that human beings have attached to this piece of media representing this place of piece of space time, is it kind of unique or representative of that piece of space? Right? So sky is going to be photographed, that tag can be all over the place. But the Cathedral of Learning doesn't usually appear in photographs taken in San Francisco, but it appears in that piece of space within Pittsburgh, as does Hammersbach Fifth's Shady Side, and uh, Walking to the Sky. Right. So I, what we've done here is we've created a collective map of human attention of what's visually interesting around the planet. And this map exists at multiple scales. So you can zoom in, you can zoom out, and understand where are people attending to what parts of the world and how are they describing it. So whenever I go somewhere, I want to know what's <laughs> worth looking at. And I consult the tens of millions of people, ultimately, that have helped contribute to this map and find what is worth paying attention to. Now, this is mobile art and code. So what I would argue is this. This is a collectively authored artwork which creates an aesthetic response and an aesthetic choice about what I want to pay attention to in the world. Much of art is about directing our attention and our engagement with the world and each other. This is one constructed as a byproduct of everyday action that people do, not with the intention of making art, but creating the ability for us to understand what ultimately millions of people find worth paying attention to in the world around them. And uh, this exists for places all over the planet as well. So tag maps for me represents really a great example of what you would think of as connecting people, the web, and the world, and doing it in a way that enables mobile art and code. Because what I want to point out is that most of these photos are not from mobile phones today, still. But now, over the last few years, think of billions of photographs, knowing where, when, who, and what. Billions of tweets, billions of pieces of text, every piece of data on the web having this metadata allows us to analyze and find what is visually interesting, what is pleasing aesthetically, what is engaging, what is provocative, what do people find worth paying attention to, and which people find these things worth paying attention to all over the world. That's what this, these technologies are enabling. In a sense, an ongoing, collectively constructed aesthetic machine. A machine that allows us to understand the vectors of human attention and where they flow and what is unusual or interesting or salient to which people. That ability to connect our experience of the world and each other to each other as a byproduct of our daily lives, I think of, it's really a Gesamtkunstwerk, right? It's the total artwork. It's the artwork that is your daily life and your attention, but connected to enough people so that the signal emerges from the noise, that the patterns surface, and we begin to find out what is happening around me, what is worth attending to, what do I find interesting. Okay, for time-wise, oh, very quickly. Um, so in San Francisco, during the day, Alcatraz is a great place to go. Uh, you don't go there at night, you can go to the Great American Music Hall. So we can also think of the day-night patterns and the other temporal patterns. And you also can discover things in the physical environment that you didn't know about because you're actually using it here at Collective Intelligence, the Wisdom Crowd. So in the Presidio, there's a bronze statue of Yoda. <laughs> at ILM, which is not on most maps and not known by most people. When I was giving a talk at my, uh, the Microsoft building, I was pulled this up. There's a quickie mart in Mountain View 
that is modeled after the Simpsons Quickie Mart with, is like the actual Quickie Mart in the Simpsons. Right, so how do we know this? How do we know this locative artwork, this environmental art that's being created? Why? Because lots and lots of people are attending to it enough to raise that as signal against other places, to name it, and to give them the ability to attend to it. And you can um, play with tag maps, you can look all over the world at different scales and see what you can discover and find. So, given the time, I'm going to um, end in just a few minutes. Why am I an invention artist? And why did I spend the last half of years writing patents? Here's why. So if you think about the invention process, the artifacts that come out of invention. So if you're an academic, you basically you write papers. That's what you're judged on, publish or perish. And those are texts written in natural language and images. Um, if you're at the media lab, it's demo or die. Uh, or if you're in you know, certain types of research and design environments, you're basically building computational texts, machines, written in code. What a patent is, it's a unique kind of art of document. It's a text written in natural language and images that describe how one skilled in the art could build a machine. So it's a form of describing an invention, a prototype, so that someone else can actually build it. And so the ideation process and design process that most of you are trained in and go through, what you don't realize is that with a subtle shift of focus and energy, that becomes a way to describe the construction of artifacts and machines that have different types of value. Patents are documents that help you build machines. That's basically what they are and why they have value. And they become a way to capture much more of the intellectual, aesthetic, and other activity that you create um, and get them out into the culture in a way that is valued. So when you're in a research context or even academic context, you have more ideas than you can prototype, more prototypes than you can ship. And if you can capture value at the stage between the idea and prototype, patent is a way of expressing, other than publishing a paper in a journal that maybe someone will read, creating a commercial value around an idea that allows it to have its own independent life, and that can then become available to others to use. So briefly, what we're doing in Invention Arts, the group of us at Yahoo that um, Ron Martinez, who is a VP of IPI, the Intellectual Property Innovation Team, has VP of Early Stage Products. Our teams worked together over several years. We did several hundred patents in a couple, in about two years. So we developed techniques that really resemble a lot of the great design research work that folks here do. Developing invention targets, inventing by design, building out the, the prototypes a little bit you can do, and building better products and better patents. So, I want to give you just a couple of tips before we close. The way you do this, and really about understanding and seeing the future, is you create invention targets. You map the white spaces. You look for the things that don't exist yet. Julian's talk talked about this. You especially look for horseless carriages. So mobile couponing is one of my favorite examples. So how many people have heard like, oh, mobile coupons are going to take over the world. It's going to be hugely important technology. It's going to transform everything. Right? Anyone who's done any commercial work in mobile has heard this a million times. Most mobile couponing systems that you've seen are horseless carriages. Why? What's a coupon? It's a printed thing that comes to you with a static offer saying 20% off at Gino's Pizza. And people think of the phone as a delivery system for those bits. You're delivering basically a bitmap to a person. But if you think of it in a Web4 framework, you say, well, there's real-time supply and demand. And you know, if the restaurant's half empty, I'll you know, give people 30% off. And if it's full, I don't want them to come in and use a coupon. And if they're about to go into Starbucks and I'm Pete's, I'll pay the person to come here. So you start to look at an economic model of real-time supply and demand that is mediated by mobility and by sensing. So horseless carriages are examples where you look at techno where the technology um, application hasn't caught up yet. People haven't really thought yet through what it's like. The horseless carriage example, of course, is the automobile being a carriage without a horse that lives itself. You repair information loss in processes and networks, and you look for what information is siloed and you connect it together. And one of the key things I just talked about is turning constants into variables and variables into code. That's one of the key ways to actually have invention happen. So to sum up, we're looking in a world where mobile's connecting 4 billion people, where sensors are letting us know where, when, who, and what, where we have an articulated graph of people and who they know and how they connect to each other, where our ability to produce, consume, share, and describe media is expanding all around the world, where these things are being done in real time, and where our abilities to manage and analyze this information are greater than ever before. That's what we call really the Web4 Invention Framework. And what we've been doing is applying this understanding of the nature of how things are changing 
to all the different aspects of human activity. So over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, everything we do is going to be affected by these devices. Why? As we said, it's a social and cognitive prosthetic that enables collective and embodied intelligence. Everyone in the world who can afford one, yes, there are 2 billion people living on $3 a day, which we shouldn't forget, but even those people are carrying phones in certain cases. They're enabling the ability to actually transform human activity. So I'm going to skip to the end because we're out of time. Say one thing here. This is a little teaser about what we're actually working on now. How does this all work with who owns the information? Who controls it? What has its value? So the really big horizon in making, connecting people to the web and the world and making that work is the economy of personal information. And there's a lot of good art and commerce and science to be done in that area. So finally, Mobile connects data and metadata about real people, places, times, objects, and events on the web and in the world. It is changing the web, the world, and us. And if you're interested in um, participating in that in ways, come talk to us. So thank you very much for a great day, for letting me go over time going. I appreciate it. And I hope this was um, illustrative and enlightening for you so that when you look at bits and you look at each other, you think about how to connect the web, the world, and people in a new way. Thanks very much.